Well, good morning, folks. You all hear me okay down the back there? I know there's been a a few glitches with the sound system, but we've been working on it and are continuing to work on it. So if it's up to standard, let us know. If it's not, uh, tell somebody else. Uh, But it's good uh, to see you gathered. It's good to hear that buzz uh, as we meet uh, to worship God together. Uh, You're all very welcome uh, here this morning. Of course, we welcome those uh, who will be listening uh, to this service on CD, internet, and our YouTube ministry uh, as well. I trust you've been welcomed at the door on the way in and will have received a copy of your announcement sheet. Uh, You'll see there are a few things starting uh, to come back on again. All the organizations are now back and all the the information is there. Uh, One omission, just uh, the Tuesday Fellowship Group. Um, is on this week, uh, so if you require further information about that, have a wee chat with Pat, but I know you have been made more uh, than welcome at that. The Burns Night Supper uh, is there, um, the sheets are in the vestibule, if you're interested in coming along, um, it's looking to be a good night, uh, please put your name on, on the sheets on the way in, and encourage you to come along, because uh, it's a good time, yes, of, of fun, but also of fellowship together as we Spend time as God's family uh, together here. Uh, And as we're on the topic of spending time as God's family together, you'll see in the front of the announcement sheet uh, the announcement for our our first plugged-in cafe church uh, since I have come along. That's on the 9th of February, you'll see, at at 6 p.m. the Sunday evening. Now, I want to emphasize, it says they're open to all ages and suitable for the whole family. It's very relaxed. If you've never been before, uh, it's a relaxed laid-back service, more casual. Uh, So we would love to see you come along. It's good to take time to come to worship together, but of course, uh, to spend that time over uh, a chat, have a chat and a cup of tea uh, together as well, as we do after the the, the morning services here uh, as well. So I encourage you in that as well, to wait behind uh, for a cup of tea. But put that date in your diary, Sunday evening, the 9th of February, and come along uh, and try it out for an evening and see what we think. That's what I'm doing anyway. I've never done it before, so I'm coming to try it out. You never know, I might not come back either. (laughs) Did he watch Mark here? (laughs) But no, uh, please uh, come along. Everything else uh, is there on your sheets. Uh, The flowers today have been put on by Ronald Doherty, and always, as we thank, uh, as we always do, we thank them uh, for that. As we come Uh, To worship, I I want to read a few verses from Romans, familiar verses, I'm sure, to to many of us, but it kind of uh, begins our focus uh, on our talk uh, today. Romans 5, uh, reading from verse 6. Uh, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Who for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we're going to sing and celebrate that uh, together as we stand uh, to open in our first piece of praise. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Let's stand and let's worship God together.
Let's just still ourselves and come to God in prayer together. Let's, let's commit our time of worship to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father God, as we come to worship here today and as the, the truth of those words of our praise falls silent, surely wonder is one of the few words that goes through our minds when we think about what you've done for us. What Jesus was prepared to do for us on that cross of Calvary where where love and mercy met to save wayward sinners like us. Thank you, Father, that, that he humbled himself and he paid that ultimate sacrifice on our behalf that has paid the price for our disobedience and our rebellion against you. Father, we thank you for those wonderful words that we read from the Apostle Paul that remind us that, yes, whilst we were still sinners, it was then Christ died for us. We thank you that our salvation depends on on nothing we can say or do for ourselves. Because we were, we are, and continue to be sinners. We have to confess that even though we've been saved and redeemed, we're, we're still tempted. We still sin. There's so much we know we should do, and yet we don't. And yes, there's so much that we know we shouldn't do but we do. Our thoughts, our words, our actions are often so far from what they should be, what we know you want them to be. <coughs> Even as we come here to, to gather your people to worship you through our praise and our prayers and even though we come to, to listen to your word, and to hear what you have to say to us, even with all that, well, we have to confess that sometimes our hearts aren't anywhere near the right place. So we often have to confess we come even here with selfish motives, selfish desires. Maybe even come harboring ill feeling and grudges against one another. In truth, we come unworthy to even be here. And yet we know that because of your great love for us, your promise of grace upon grace in our lives, we know we can know your forgiveness when we come honestly and humbly and ask you for it. And so, Father, will you forgive us today? Will you focus our hearts and our minds on what is important here today? We are here to worship and to meet with the almighty and living God. So will you help us in this time to worship you rightly? Help us and enthuse us to follow Jesus' footsteps as he leads us through this life and into that hope of glory where, well, as we've sang, where we can and will boldly approach your eternal throne, clothed in Jesus' divine righteousness. So, Father, will you help us and lead us and guide us in this time we spend together and in the, the days ahead? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to turn to God's Word uh, together now. We're continuing uh, in our series through the book of, of Philippians. If you're following uh, in one of the, the church Bibles, if you picked one up on the way in, it's on page uh, 1180. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, uh, and we'll read uh, the little portion we, we read last week and then continue uh, through uh, to, to this week's. 
Philippians 3, reading from verse 1. This is God's word to us. Uh, No confidence in the flesh. Uh, It begins in my uh, version here. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write these things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of their surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. The end our reading there. And verse 11, and we trust that God will speak to us as we look at that uh, together uh, later on. Young folk want to come to the front, uh, and I'll come down, and we'll have a little chat together uh, down the front. seat down. Good to see you all today. Come on on up a bit. Come on. Don't be scared of the big, the big scary man up the front. Eh? Come on up out of the aisle. We doing good? We're all good today? All happy? All really excited? Back at school and all the rest of it? No. Oh dear. You hate school? School is a wonderful place, isn't it? Well, listen, I have a couple of things with me today, and I didn't bring my bag because it wouldn't fit into my bag. A ladder. I brought my stepladder with me today. Are you confused? Yeah. Right, we're just going to leave the ladder there for a wee minute and we'll see as we go along. And in my hand, I've got got little bits of paper with some things written on them. And I want you to tell me if they're good things or they're bad things. Are they good things for us to do or are they bad things for us to do? What about this one? Reading the Bible, is that a good thing to do? That's a really good thing to do. It's it's not a bad thing to do. It's a good thing to do. Right, now I'm going to really confuse you, and I'm going to just set it there. On the ladder, okay. What about... How do we see? Going to church? Is that a good thing? Is that a good thing? Where will we put it? On the next, the second step? Right, okay. What about going to Sunday school? Is that good? We all like Sunday school, don't we? Yeah. Sunday school's good. You don't like school, you don't like Sunday school. You like Sunday school. We'll put it on there. All really good things to do, aren't they? What about praying? Is that a good thing? 
you getting the gist here? They're all really good things, aren't they? It's good to pray. What about this? Serving and helping. You know what that is? Serving God, helping other people. Good thing as well, isn't it? It's a, it's a really good list, isn't it? Right, giving. Good. And giving our offering stuff. We're going to do that in a wee minute. They're all good things. Right, where are they going? Where are they going? They're going up the way, aren't they? And you see, if you were listening to what we read from the Bible and what we've been thinking about for this past few days, or this past few weeks, is about Paul. And Paul told us all these great things that he had done in his life. He was the best person at going to church. He read his Bible every day. He prayed every day when he was supposed to. He gave his offerings. He helped people. He done all those things. And you know, that's what he thought they were like. It was like a set of steps that would take him up to heaven. And do you think they got him there? Do you think if I climbed up the steps, if I read my Bible, does that get me closer to heaven? If I go to church... Is that going to get me closer to heaven? Let me just check it here. <laughs> if we go to Sunday school, are we getting closer to heaven? Yeah. If we pray, does that get us? How are you doing down the back there? <laughs> we pray. Is that really getting us closer to heaven? Yeah. How high will I go? Very high, right up. (laughs) Future health and safety man, you're not allowed to do that. (laughs) We'll we'll come down a step or two, won't we? That would hurt if I fell down there. But you see, this is the problem. We think that all these things, and when we do all these things, they get us closer to heaven. That they're all, just because they're all really good things, that will get us closer to heaven. But of course, we know what Paul, what we've just read about Paul, why he says all those things are good, and they are all good for us to do. The only thing that gets us up to heaven is knowing Jesus. And that's what he talks about, believing in Jesus, exactly. You've got it in one. The only thing that can get us closer to God is believing in Jesus. And then we come into that relationship with God. And I want to encourage you to do all these things. Because Paul says they're all really good things. But we need to trust and believe in Jesus. Because that is the only thing that will get us to heaven. Let me pray with you and then we're going to sing. We're going to sing a song about trusting in Jesus. Uh, and then... But we'll, we'll continue. Let's pray. You've got a car? Let's, let's pray first, and then we'll see your car. Father, we want to thank you again for Jesus, and we thank you for all these things that we can do, and we recognize that they are all good things for us to do, to go to Sunday school, to pray, to, to read our Bibles. Uh, but Lord, we know that ultimately the greatest thing that we can do is to come into that relationship with you, to believe in you and to trust in Jesus. Lord, we pray for our young people that we pray for ourselves too that each of us would come into that relationship that we would know that same joy that that Paul knew of knowing Christ Jesus as his Lord. We pray for our young people as they will go to children's church shortly. We pray that they would learn more and more about you or that they would come to know you as their Lord and their Savior. So will you bless them? Bless us and help us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, we better do this. You didn't remind me. Any birthdays this week? No? No birthdays. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And as everybody gets ready to stand and sing, you can grab a sweetie, but then we're going to sing. Don't be putting it in your mouth because you'll not be able to sing. You'll not be able to chew and sing, will you?
We're going to stand, we're going to sing, I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only thee. Let's, let's all stand and let's worship God. Go ahead. As the children go back to their seats, we're going to prepare to worship God uh, as we continue in worship uh, this time uh, with our, our offering. So your morning offering uh, will now be received. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, as always, for this amazing opportunity to come and to worship you through our offering. Father, we thank you for everything you do for us. We thank you for each and every blessing we receive, which comes from your hand. And Father, we return this as a token of our love and appreciation for all that you do for us. And so will you bless this offering? Will you use it? And will you use us for your glory 
and that of your Son and our Saviour Jesus. Amen. continue in that attitude of prayerfulness as we just pause in the midst of our service as we often do uh, to bring our prayers of intercession as we come to pray for the needs uh, of others and as I always do can I encourage you as we pray as God brings uh, people and situations to your mind uh, to bring them uh, to God in prayer but allow me to lead you in this time so let's let's pray together our father what a a wonderful privilege and opportunity we have the sense to enter the very throne room of God to bring our prayers and our petitions for others to you Father we're so thankful for this free access we have because of what Jesus has done for us we thank you that he has opened up this way for us to speak to you, the Almighty God, in prayer. And we're thankful for the, the knowledge and assurance that when we come, we come with we can come with, with with our burdens, with our anxieties, to know that you are are there, to listen to them, and to help us to carry those burdens. And so we want to pray. Lord, for, yes, for those who you bring to our mind, who we know are struggling at the minute. I'm going to pray for those who carry that, that burden of illness. Lord, you know, and we know many who are struggling in many different ways, struggling physically, struggling emotionally, maybe even struggling spiritually with different kinds of illness and even bereavement with the burden of the reality of life. And Lord, we simply pray for your help. We pray for your strength and for your comfort for, for all who find themselves in that, that darker place today. And Father, we want to pray for our land and for our government. Lord, your word tells us, commands us as such to pray for our leaders. And Lord, as we stand today on the, the brink of this new government being formed, the beginning work, we, we pray for that government. We pray for peace and harmony. We pray for respect for each other and each other's views and opinions. We pray for the, the difficulties that, that lie ahead. Lord, we all know there's so much to, to be sorted out and to be decided for the good of this country, and that is our prayer. Lord, that it would be for the benefit of all and not just particular groups. We pray for your people that you've placed in positions of power. We pray that they would seek your wisdom and discernment in everything that they do. We pray for their witness for you as they do that. 
And you pray that you would help them to, to take their stand on matters of faith and matters that are contrary to your word. We just pray for them and for the strength and the help that they would need. Again, Lord, we know there is much that needs to be sorted. There's much that has been forced upon us that is so contrary to your word. Lord, we pray that these things could be overturned. So we pray that you would intervene. Lord, you would change hearts and minds. You would draw people into yourself and to the truth of your word. And Father, we pray for ourselves as your fellowship here. Or we continue to pray that you would build us up, that you would unite us in fellowship together. And yes, that you would use us for your glory in this place and in the places you've called us to be day by day. So, Lord, use us for the sake of your Son and our Saviour, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing our our next piece of praise together. Our next piece is, Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills the breast. Let's stand and let's worship God as we prepare to come to his word. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but there was a, a film that came out a, a number of years ago that starred a Robert Redford that was called All Is Lost. It's a bit of a strange film, um, if you've seen it, uh, because it only has the cast of one, uh, Redford himself. And there is virtually no dialogue in it at all. There are only a few lines spoken by uh, the main character in the entire film. But what did make it moving for a lot of people uh, was the fact that instead of the the usual dialogue and and the usual way we would see films, 
Uh, Redford narrates most of the film from what is supposed to be the diary of this main character uh, as he finds himself struggling to survive in the middle of the Indian Ocean uh, after his yacht has collided uh, with a stray shipping uh, container floating uh, around in the sea. Uh, a hole uh, had been ripped in the hull of his, hull of his boat uh, and it's flooded and it's drifting almost uncontrollably. And so the film uh, depicts this struggle to survive uh, and the struggle to attract the attention of, of any kind of passing ship that, that could save him. His efforts are, are hampered, uh, as you can see from the picture, by the storm, which amongst other things capsizes his boat and he's thrown overboard into the sea. And he only manages to get back onto a raft after a really long struggle. Now, obviously, I'm not going to narrate the whole film for you here today, um, but I am going to spoil the ending for you. So if you haven't seen it, sorry. Um, But after eight days of struggling in the sea, of this immense struggle, uh, he has given up all hope of being saved, and he writes a, a letter puts it in a bottle uh, and throws it overboard. And in the letter he he says this. He says, I'm sorry. I know that that means little at this point, but I am. I tried. I think you'd all agree that I had tried to be true, to be strong, to be kind, to love, to be right. But all is lost. All is lost hence the title of the film and later that night he sees a light in the distance which might just be a ship coming to rescue him and the only option left for him is to to light a small signal fire from the boat's journal and its charts and as if things weren't bad enough as Hollywood does the signal fire gets out of control and starts to burn his raft and he falls into the water again Of course, by this stage, he's weak, struggling to swim, and having finally lost all hope of survival, he stops swimming and allows himself to begin to sink to the bottom of the ocean. Just before he drowns, right at the last minute, he sees the light of the searchlight of the boat. So he swims back to the surface and he grasps this outstretched hand and the fellow man's. All is lost or was it? In his note he felt that everything was lost. Was it all lost? Now we looked together last week at how Paul was depending on all his different achievements how he was depending on his upbringing and so on for the salvation of his soul. We've seen how Paul had devoted his entire life to relying on things like the ritual of circumcision, uh, his background, his standing in society, and, and of course the most dangerous one of all, his religion. He relied heavily on the fact that he was a good religious man and he worked hard at keeping the law in the hope that he could please God enough and ensure him his place in heaven. But then, then he said, watch out. Watch out because that is all just a hopeless dream if that's what you've been trusting in, if that's what you've been pinning your hopes on. So he said last week, ritual, race, and religion just don't cut it anymore. So he says, don't trust in them for your salvation. And after rhyming off what we called his vast CV as such. Paul uses those immortal words as well, doesn't he? He says that all is lost. His ritual, his race, his background, his religion, all is lost. All those things that I might count as profit, I now reckon as loss. And not only those things, I reckon everything has complete loss. All is lost. Is it really? We cast all those things aside. 
are we really left with nothing? Well, you know the answer. It's absolutely not, because we are left with the one thing which is far greater in comparison to anything we can have or achieve by ourselves. We have the thing that is at the, the very heart of these entire verses. And it's in that magnificent verse which but it has to be one of my all-time favorites. I consider everything lost compared to, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I don't know about you, but does that not stir up something special inside you? Does that not stir up your heart even as you just say it? Never mind recognize the reality of it in your own life yes everything is a loss all those things are a loss but compared only compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord you see knowing that things were very different for Paul weren't they they're very different for us too if we know Jesus all those things that that were big bonus points for Paul, are nothing. They're worthless. Because he's been made new. He's been made into that new creation that he talks about when he's writing to the church in Corinth. The old has gone and the new has come. Because he has placed his faith and his confidence and his trust in Jesus. In a sense, he's like somebody who's been cured from an addiction to something. He just wants to throw it away, to cast it aside. Chuck away all that has enslaved him and embrace this new freedom and liberty because he's now in the Lord, as he says. He's a brother of Jesus himself. So what's so special about it that a man with a resume like Paul is willing to undergo this heart transplant Forget about everything that he has held on to all his life. He's held on to for dear life, as we would say. Everything that he has classed as important all his life. Why would he just cast that aside? Well, it's simple, isn't it? We've said it already. He can rejoice. And he can do it because, as he's told the the Philippians earlier, he knows Jesus. He lays it out on the table quite clearly for us, doesn't he? Everything he knew and he held dear was garbage, as we read. It was rubbish. Rubbish that he was prepared to throw away because he knew the joy of knowing and gaining Christ in his life. And friends, that is something worth trusting in. And after telling us what not to trust in for our salvation, of course, Paul points us to Jesus as the one and only thing that we should trust in. But he also gives us a number of benefits that we have when we know Jesus. Benefits which he says far outweigh all those earthly gains. So that's what we're going to think about today. These couple of gains that Paul talks about. To keep things easy again, uh, there's a couple of more R's for you this week. The first R, the first gain that Paul says we get when we trust in Jesus is the righteousness of Christ. He refers back briefly to, to that legalistic righteousness which comes from the law. That righteousness which he, of course, said he was faultless in. But he says he doesn't want to be known for that righteousness anymore. He wants to be known for the kind of righteousness that comes from God. Righteousness that can only be found in Jesus. Friends, righteousness is one of those words which we talk about very easily and we use very easily. But it is a concept which is of paramount importance to us as it was for Judaism in the first century when Paul was writing here. It's important because it it was clearly assumed that only the righteous, only righteous people please God. 
And only righteous people could receive benefits from God. And righteousness relates to where our heart lies with God and our relationship with him. And Paul is, is very clear here about the inability of our own righteousness to save us. And that's why he points us to Christ's righteousness. Because there is only two. There are only two kinds of righteousness. There's our own, which neither forgives our sin, nor gives us the perfect righteousness that we need to be accepted by by God. Then there's the second kind. The only one acceptable by God. And that is righteousness found by faith in Christ. When a repentant sinner turns to Christ, they're not only pardoned for their sins, the complete, perfect righteousness of Jesus is counted as his or hers. Think of that old illustration, which I'm sure you've heard before, when God looks at us, if we have accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, he doesn't see us. He sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus in us. But if we're depending on our own righteousness, if we haven't put our faith and trust in Jesus, then as Isaiah puts it, all God sees is filthy rags. Paul, consistent with the rest of Scripture, only gives us two choices. Either we're found in him, we either we're found trusting in Jesus and we are saved, or we look outside of him and to ourselves and we're lost. Either we completely trust in Jesus or we're facing a completely lost eternity. Righteousness is the first gain that we get from casting everything aside. The second R, or the gain, is knowing resurrection power. Righteousness and resurrection power. And by power, Paul obviously doesn't mean it in any sense of authority. At its heart, it's a a power that that helps us face the challenges and and trials of, of everyday life. That's why he ties it in there with this desire. This des- he ties this desire for resurrection power in with sharing with Christ's suffering. It's the power to help us through suffering. And if anybody knows anything about suffering for the cause of Christ, surely it is Paul. But as the Spirit of God works in our life, enables us to grow in our faith and knowledge of God. It helps us to stand up to the different trials as we live out our lives in a sinful world that we could so easily be dragged down by. It's not what Paul reminds us in Corinthians. My grace is sufficient for you, he says, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When we admit we have no power or strength within ourselves, when we die to ourselves and focus our lives on the work of the cross, then we can know the strength and power of God working in us and through us, even in our weaknesses, especially in our weaknesses. Paul knew he needed that God-given grace to die to himself, to focus on the cross, to help him take up his own cross each and every day. There's no other way that he could face up to such unjust suffering with a supernatural power and joy in his heart other than knowing this supernatural power of the resurrection of Jesus. He knew that the cross must be at the heart of the messenger just as as much as it is in the message. As we face the different trials of life, As we too, like Paul, maybe face persecution or or ridicule for our faith and belief. Friends, there's, well, in the world we live in today, you know as well as I do, there's plenty of suffering. There's plenty of persecution indeed, which is 
coming more and more our way all the time as opposition to the message of the cross mounts each and every day. But isn't that an awesome gain? Isn't that an awesome gain to have if you know Jesus? To know that you have that same power of God that raised Jesus from the dead available to help you live your new life in him. Righteousness and resurrection power, friends, are amazing gains. Gains to counterbalance what you think you might lose when you give your life to Jesus. Isn't it going to be true to say that, that losing those worldly and earthly things is one of the greatest stumbling blocks for people when they feel God working in their hearts? What about everything of God? What about all the worldly possessions I have? Well, doesn't Paul change our focus? Because those worldly things are the things that Satan loves to use to tempt us. But friend, all is not lost. Even if you give up all those things. All is not lost and never will all be lost if you turn to Jesus. Because you can know the power, the joy and the benefits of a relationship with the Almighty God. You too can know the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. Which, friend, far outweighs anything that this world can offer you. All is not lost. We gain everything when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. Friend, as I have done in previous weeks, If you haven't made that choice, if you're sitting here today and you're wondering, what if? What if I throw all this aside? What will I have? If you're holding on to those things of the world, thinking you can't let them go because all, you would just lose everything. An example of Paul here is that All is not lost. All is not lost. Because you will gain everything in the world. Let me pray with you. Let's pray. Father, like Paul, we we do, we have to confess how much we love the things of the world. How much we we like our rituals and traditions. How much we like our self-importance and standing in community. Standing in church even. How much we like everything we possess. But unlike Paul... Or we want to hold on to them. We're anxious and we're worried that when we cast all that aside that we'll be left with nothing. We're anxious about what the future would hold if we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And yet we thank you for your word today that or as Paul lays it out for us we gain everything. We gain something which is of far greater importance importance than anything we could amass in this world we gain salvation we gain that relationship with the almighty God we gain that surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as our Lord Father nothing in this world can compare to that And Lord, for those of us here today who know that relationship, Lord, we pray that that would even stir our hearts and remind us of what a wonderful thing we have. For those maybe who haven't made that decision, who are worried and anxious, 
Lord, we pray that you would allay their fears, that you would speak to their hearts today, and that they, in turn, would speak to you, or draw them to faith and trust in you. And let them, let them know the joy, the true joy of being in that relationship with you. And Father, we thank you. We do, we thank you that when you look at us, having put our faith and trust in Jesus, you see his true righteousness. And we thank you for the power that helps us through this life. Lord, we pray that each of us would know that deep in our hearts today. So speak to us, each one and all of us, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to close our service. Our last piece of praise is uh, all I once held dear, built my life upon, all this world of years and wars that won. Again, it's that sense of all we hold dear, casting it aside uh, and turning uh, to God and turning to Jesus. Let's stand and let's worship God together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, as always, for this time of worship. Father, we thank you for the blessing that it has been. And Lord, we pray now that as we leave this place, that the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would go with each of us now and forevermore.